one. And we'll wait till a few people. I can't see anything. Get anybody? No comments will appear here. Oh, we got two people. So we'll wait. And I think, yeah, because then you can go on yours. But I think you have to mute it or else we get feedback. Oh, okay. Just trying to, okay, so trying to reconnect. Can they, oh. can they hear us? Probably. Oh, oh my god. I know, my phone's like backwards. So we have four, five people. <laughs> I don't remember it being this funny before. <laughs> oh, we got nine. Can they see us? Mm -hmm. I should think I, so. Should I stop it? And we're just standing here like it's that. Kind of, uh, yeah, you could you could banter, have coffee talk. <laughs> oh, there's my coffee over there. Chance to banter, so we're gonna banter. <laughs> we're waiting for a few more people to show. If you can hear us, we're not sure you can. We're still new at this, <laughs> but I think I'm gonna start. Let I'm just gonna. Say, I'm gonna say, go. well, I'm Gail Dufresne. And I'm, I'm the educational chair of Atha, and I'm Amy Hoffman. I'm the assistant. Amy's my trusty assistant who's going to help with all sorts of things as we go along. Um, what's, what's interesting is that I've, I don't ever write these out because I like them to be spontaneous. So I'm not really sure what Amy's going to do, but she's sure going to help me. And uh, another thing that I find kind of amusing is I decided to write things down this time. And, of course, I wrote down probably too many things. But I will walk you through all this, so don't panic with all of this. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is one of my favorite topics, is, which is the value of value. I wrote about this in my book, which I'm going to plug my book just because I kind of have to. Here's Amy, the value, and, and this, is, this is my book. It was published by Rogue Hooking Magazine, and I actually have a whole chapter in this on the value of value because, to me, that's the way to approach designing a rug. Because, as I said, in, uh, as I um, talked about, sorry, as I, as I labeled this talk, color gets the, the credit, but value does all the work. And so what we're going to be talking about is understanding value, contrast, and intensity. And my favorite teacher, most influential teacher, was Marjorie Judson, and she always said that no color stands alone. And I like to say that no value stands alone, because if you get the value right, you get the rug right. And um, the, the value establishes and solidifies the design. So when you have, excuse me again, all of these rugs in here are all set up just by value. There's no color in these rugs. And as you can see, that's what establishes the design. So you can color them, but when you start out, you can just do it with a black and white rug, which is basically what I did. So how I started this whole thing was I was asked to teach, about 20 years ago, I was asked to teach a log cabin class, and I had no idea what a log cabin was. And Mark, you can, you can scan around. So I, and I started doing all of these rugs, and what I did was I looked at a book, uh, it was a, a um, William Kent book, which was a book in 1941 that was in black and white. And so I saw, I thought in terms of black and white. And so Mark, just show him a picture of this. Here's what I was looking at. So I wasn't looking at color. I was looking at values. So what I decided to do is I wanted to make a scrap rug. And I took all this wool that I had that I hadn't used. It was mostly as is. And I separated it into light and dark. <laughs> light and dark, okay? So I, I, I was looking at these pictures here, and you can hold these up. I was looking at these pictures, and so all I saw was light and dark. So I had a light pile and I had a dark pile. My dark pile is bigger, and when you do this, I think I mentioned to you that you could bring your wool. I don't know whether I'm going to do that because I thought it might be more confusing if we had a whole bunch of wool. So I just took a little bit of wool 
And I tend to be a person that goes more towards dark colors, not light colors. So I, I always have more dark wool than light. So you could do the rug like this, but you could have huge piles and use it all because you're just going to throw it in as is, hit or miss. So I have the light side and I have the dark side. And then I knew from quilt magazines and reading that there, there was a chimney to a log cabin and that was usually red. So I used this for my chimney. So the first rug that I did was this one here. And basically I had, this was my chimney and this was my light and this was my dark. And I used black for the grid lines and black for the border. And I took one line of the red and I put that on the outside of the rug. And I did this rug in less than 30, uh, 30 days because I was nuts about it. It was so much fun. It was just like candy. I completely, I just put, I cut the wool. I think I did it in an eight cut. I put all the wool in the bags and I just <coughs> pulled it out randomly. So I had, I had this bag and I had this bag and I had this bag. And I just pulled randomly out of the bags. That's how I made this rug. And I didn't worry about this piece of particular wool ending up over there. I just hooked and it all just worked. And I love doing this. So I decided to take it a step further. And that's when I did this rug. So this rug, I separated the wool into light. And then I had this, actually, Amy, you might even be able to see what I did here. So then I had these darks. These were the darks that I used over there. And these were probably here. Or these are a medium value, so they can actually go either way. But what I did, yes, indeed, she's already seen it, which you probably have too. So I pulled these out of this pile. These, these were used over here. But because these are kind of a light medium or a dark, a medium dark, you could use these either way. I pulled these out and I had a light, I had a medium, and I had a dark. I still had my red, but I had, I made, this was dark, this was the medium, that was the light, and I took out of the dark pile, I pulled out the reds, and I made the red polka dots right there with the red wall. And if you notice this, this is less red than that because I pulled all the red plaids out of this. So I made a, a different dimension just by sorting the wool differently. And then I made the black polka dots. And that was the hardest thing to do. I absolutely love black textures. So these are all different black textures. And what I had, what I found, is this fabulous piece. I don't think there's, this is when it became, if I ever was a purist using just 100% wool, I don't know if I ever was, but I don't think this has 1% of wool in it, let alone 100%. But this polyester, or whatever it is, was, was, is what made these black circles work. Now, Amy, Amy, you want to check for questions to see if I'm losing anybody? Because some people really get this and some people really have trouble with this concept. So I want to make sure that I'm not losing anybody. I don't think there's any questions. There's no questions. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I'm going to move on to this. So the same concept, I decided to do another rug because I love this so much. So I did a third rug, which was this one over here. And this has just medium and dark. And I still use the red for the center, but I eliminated, this is the first rug I eliminated wool. So I did not use this light wool. I pulled this light wool out because um, it would have thrown off the whole thing. I was going for a low chroma rug. And so this is how I made this rug. Again, just using, just changing up values. So what I realized when I did these rugs is how to use light and dark so that it became intuitive. Before that time, I had some sense of doing a good rug. I was able to do it because I have a good color sense intuitively, and most of us do, even though we don't realize it. So I would do a rug, and every time I color planned the rug, it would be a challenge. So when I was doing this rug, 
This is my, oops, my game board. So I had, I had done all the lizards, I had done all the ladders, and I was working on the background. And I kept using different colors in the background. I would put in a yellow square, I would put in a white square, I would put in uh, like a putty colored square, and I, and I didn't know which one I liked the best. I didn't know which one was working. I thought maybe they were, some of them weren't working and I didn't know which one I liked the best. And so I was in a class and I'm sure I was driving my, my teacher crazy. And as everybody was walking by, I would ask them, which one of these do you like best? Which color do you think works? And they would pick colors. Somebody said, well, I like the yellow one. And somebody said, I like the putty one or the beige one. So then what I did, because I still couldn't decide, is I, and I put the rug over a couch to the back of the couch, and I just walked by it so that I could see, try to figure out what the problem was. And at some point I realized that I had intuitively done it right because I used a light value for the whole background. And I, I never got that, I didn't get that concept until I started working with these log cabins and got into touch with the light, medium, and the dark thing. So that's when I realized what makes a rug work and what makes a design work. After that rug and finishing that rug and after these log cabin rugs, which I call value rugs, by the way, I wanna point out this big rug, which I think is about four by five, I hooked this twice. So Mark show I showed him, I was showing you this one as I was showing you about the values. Well, I hooked this rug a second time because I thought they had been lost in the mail. I had sent them to Rug Hooking Magazine for an article and I thought UPS had, had um, lost them and I was completely freaked out. So I actually rehooked this entire rug, which it's hard for me to believe I used to hook that much, but I did, I hooked every day. So this is basically the same rug same design, but I just put some of the motifs that I like to work on with other stuff. I have sunflowers and frogs and lizards and all kinds of stuff in there. And you can see how I have the red polka dots and the black polka dots and the white and the medium and the dark. I'm sorry, light, medium and dark. So then, once I got that concept, I did the star log cabin. And so the star log cabin is a color plan. And it's obviously, it's a yellow and a blue rug. I knew at that point how to use the values to make the star appear, but I used colors to do it. So the beginning, the, the middle square is a kind of a combination of light, medium, and dark. But then as I went out, these squares, or triangles, they are actually, are light. And as I went out to here, this is darker. Then I went back to white, light again, but I, and this is darker still. So I started with the yellow in the center and I got darker as I went out. And I have the blue, where I started with the blue, it got darker as I went out. So this is, the, this is the lightest blue. And then it got darker. And then I actually went out to use an, a, a mohair that has black and green in it. But it, I did it really by value, not by color. And if you figure out how to do that, it's gonna solve all of your problems because usually the problem with a rug is a, is a problem of, of value. So let's see, here is, <coughs> oh, here's another color plan. So again, and each, so each rug has, has contrast. The contrast is light and, light and dark and playing light and dark with them. So I've got the light and I've got the dark here and I've got the medium. And that is what's making that design work. Questions? I don't think you need so far. No questions? No. Okay. I'm going to password this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where do we go from here? Um, intensity. That's dull and bright. And basically, when you do a rug, you want to have 
the brightest part of your rug what you want to accentuate because that's what you want that's where your 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 eye goes first to the to the, the brightest so that's what you want to have for your main motif so when i did the lizard and ladders rug i've got the the lizards are brighter on the background the lighter background and so the first thing you see are those lizards and they're on that light background. If I had used a medium background, I would have had a lower contrast, and with a lower contrast, they, would have, they wouldn't have stood out so far. But because I had a pretty high contrast, another thing I tend to do is I tend to outline motifs with, if you look at this, this is all on a three, by the way, which is crazy, but that's what I did. So this, this is outlined with a black, so the black is gonna make it pop out even more from the light. So when you have, when you, when you want whatever your motif is, you want that to stand out from your background. Question, what yes. color are the grid lines on this background? <clears throat> Good question. The grid lines are a texture, which I prefer textures to grid lines. Even though I used black grid lines on the log cabins that were value rugs, the first ones that I did, I call value rugs because I really just thought in terms of light, medium, and dark. I use black grid lines, but I don't usually like to use black grid lines because, as I said with contrast, the, the higher the contrast, the more obvious that part of the rug. So if I had black grid lines next to those light squares, it would have been really harsh, and that's not what I was trying to accentuate. So it's like a medium value tweed that I used. And that brings up another, uh, another <coughs> talking about the brightness I forgot about for a second here. So, I, it took me a while to do this rug. I, as I said, it's four by four and it's almost all in a three cut, except maybe I hurried it up and did a four in the background here. And I couldn't figure out what to do the ladders. And I took this rug to a uh, class with Marjorie Judson. And I said to her, Marjorie, I don't know what color to do those ladders. I just can't figure it out. And she very passively looked at it and she said, well, how do you play the game? And I said, well, the way you play the game is you go around and you roll the dice. It actually is a playable game, by the way. It's, if that's how you win it, you get here and you start, the start is here. So you go around like this. So you're going around like this. And if you hit a ladder here, this would be number, say, 10. You get to go up to, say, number, I don't know, let's say 18. So... I told her the point of the game is to get to the center and go through all the numbers progressively. And she said, then aren't the ladders really important? And I said, yeah, the ladders really are important. So she said, shouldn't they be the brightest part of the rug? And I said, yeah. So I, this, this is, I got brighter as I go along. So when I did this rug, which was quite a while ago, this was really bright to me. But the, the ladders are quite bright because... They are very important and you can't hold that rug up anymore. I could have done black, but black would have been very stark. Same, same concept as the grid line, so I didn't use black. I used like a gold. Um, and so that's why those ladders became bright. And the grid lines are, te are texture, medium texture, because I don't want those to stand out. Does there's that a, explain that? Any other questions on a that? quick question about if you could briefly explain chroma. Chroma, yes. Chroma is the same as intensity, and that's, that's dull and bright. And I, that's a great question. So, this rug, Amy, this is going to be easier for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, on this rug, after figuring out chroma and values, I started superimposing and I did a lot of geometrics. I started superimposing animals over my geometrics. And the cool part that, about that is I realized if I took neutrals, neutrals would stand out against the colors and they would look 3D. So this is Ruby Pearl, for those of you who know Ruby. I've hooked him several times. So Ruby is sitting atop a very cool, kind of stolen from K Facet background. I love K Facet. He's a quilter who does incredible designs and has incredible color plans. So he, Ruby is sitting atop, I think it's called an envelope design. And he stands right out because there's no color in him. He's all neutrals. He's, he's white and, and brown and a little black. 
And so the chroma, this, this is brighter than the neutrals. But I didn't use all bright wool in here. I used just little bits of bright wool. And in every square, I have some bright wool, but in really small amounts because otherwise it would have been too much. So if you look, most of this is as-is textured wool in an eight cut, but I used three cuts and each square, I used a three cut of a brighter color. So you got it there, the pink, you've got a yellow there, you got a little bit of a yellow there. I took this piece, which is white, so it's lighter and yellow, and it goes right to his face, and I did that on purpose, so you'd be looking at Ruby. And his eye, I heard that goats really have bright yellow eyes, but I took Artisan's license and I made him have bright yellow eyes because I liked it. So in each of these squares, I have just a little bit of bright, and I did that again, go down to this Ruby. This is the big Ruby. This is the Goat Hill Ruby Pearl. And when people look at this, I think they think the whole rug is bright, but it's really not. The only part that's bright is, I believe, in one, in each of these squares, there's a brighter color. So here's the hot pink that I used in the little ruby. Here's the yellow that I used in the little ruby. There's some orange. I probably did the same thing. Yes, if you see, I ha he has a yellow eye again. And right in the front of his nose, there's, there's yellow. I'm going to, yeah, point it out. I don't want to crawl over there. So, so that right there. And then at the top of his head, I've got yellow. So I, I strategically placed that so that you would be looking at my star. And my star is the goat. And, and that's, that's what you would want to be, want to have a star. Um, if, you, if you didn't use contrast and chroma in this manner, you're, this is this is obvious, but if you think about it, if you didn't use it this way, your main motif would simply not stand out. And that's what happens a lot of times. Let's show black and white pictures. So this is the best. The best thing to do to evaluate your rug, I think, is to take a black and white picture of it. So if you look at these black and white pictures, see how they're, the motifs, the, the rose, the, the flowers and the leaves are all coming out of this background. So you don't know what these colors are and, and you don't have to, but if you took a picture of this and you couldn't see those flowers, then you know it's not working if that's what you want to accentuate. Questions? Is there still going? Yeah, get, and get I think there was one before about if you're explaining your book about how to do the grid lines or backing grid lines. Like picking out the size maybe? You mean picking out the colors of the grid lines? I'm not sure. It was a while ago. I don't know. Oh, it was a while ago. <laughs> oh, okay. Grid lines. <laughs> so I can go on and on about grid lines. I'm going to go off a little bit, but not much because it's still a value thing. I have done a lot of inch mats, and uh, they're all over the place. Mark, turn around, and you can point out these, these pieces right here. Let me get rid of this apple. Like that. So these are all gridded areas, gridded patterns. And I'm going to show you one. This is the first one I did. And that was, I love that one. That was, a, I just copied it out of a, a book. It was a little quilt pattern. Those are all one inch squares. It's all number three cut. I love it because I did use the black grid lines and I really like those, the way that looks. It's just really poppy and I just think it's really cool. That was the first one I did. And I tend to do things over and over again. So I did, uh, I had uh, years of doing inch mats. So they're everywhere in this room. Uh, so Mark actually sitting, there's three right there behind that one. And the first one, the sunflower, if you'll notice, has light, has light grid lines. That light grid lines gives, I think, a real contemporary look. And again, I want to point out the fact that if you look at it, there's all different values in chroma in there. That's what this lesson is about. So the, the light, you need, you need all those, you need relative values of those. So the, the lightest is the grid line. So then I kind of got rid of having the light in there. So then I could just play with, with color because the light is separating the colors. The colors of the squares are pretty much the same value. And so if I didn't have those light grid lines in there, they would all blend together if you can imagine that. Like imagine just having, if you just had all these colors together, 
they would not stand out anywhere near as well if you if you didn't have those those light lines. The next one is the sheep. I used a really cool, my favorite wool. I'm going to see if I can quickly find that. Here's my favorite wool. And I'm not selling it, you can't have any. But this is, this is the grid lines that I used here. So not, this is really cool because it also has the red of the rug in there. So the grid lines here are this. So they're, it's a black texture. I love black textures because you get your dark in there, but it's not, it's not as harsh as a solid black. Uh, do you measure the drawing of the grid lines, or do you count the threads, and how exact? Oh, you can count the threads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's you're going to have to do that for every different backing you use. You'll need to count the threads if you want to do that. I tend not to do that because I'm not so precise. You can, but I have an 18 inch ruler versus a 12 inch ruler because uh, I, I when I measure out my wool, I'm usually measuring out in half yard, so 18 inches. The side of that ruler is one and a quarter inches. And so I use that a lot. And so basically my basic inch mat after I did this, this first one is like just one inch. I use a one quarter, one and a quarter inch line to measure this out. And then I have an area for like a one inch square and then the quarter inch, it will be for the grid line. So you can measure it out. Sometimes actually I have to tell you if you're measuring it out that um, linen can have a different ca thread count, th pair, perpendicularly and parallelly. So you have to measure it both ways. And you can do that. And if you do that, it makes a difference. It makes it really precise, but I don't do that anymore. And, oh, this, and this one's a dip dye. This is a fabulous dip dye on this guy. And so again, my, this is a little brighter. I'm trying to analyze all this for you. This is a little brighter and there, there's my dark, so you've got the medium. I'm going to call this medium. The, the grid lines here versus dark here or here are medium. And so you've got the bright and the dark and the medium. Anything you do, you can analyze in terms of bright, medium, and dark. So if you did that rug and you used black grid lines, can you see that you would lose your grid line when you got to this black square? Which if you want to lose your grid line when you get to that black square, that's okay. But that might not be what you're going for. So I tend to want everything to stand out a little bit. So it all depends on what you're trying to accentuate and what you're going for. Here's another one. Grid lines. With a cute sheep. So again, this is a superimposed animal. I used all neutrals on the sheep, and then the background is the colors, the grid lines are the dark, the sheep himself is the light, the red behind the sheep's head is the bright, and that's what makes him stand out even more because he's on that bright background. So light comes forward, so the sheep looks like he's coming towards you. Got it? What else haven't we shown? Any other questions? Not yet. Here's what I'm just doing. Now I'm gonna bring out my bits. This is what we were gonna do. And we still, still can do this. So before this presentation, I started doing another geometric. Just because, oh, you can hold that up, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know what you guys, what kind of wool you have at home. I have a feeling that you all have ends and stuff left over. Well, here's mine. And I am doing that rug out of here. And I am just picking out what I want to use out of this. And this is like a mess. It's got pieces of wool in here. This is something I use to coat weight wool to back to bind something. This is some yarn I have in here. I have a lot of swatches or um Selvages in here, and then I have all this leftover wool that I have. So I'm just picking, I also, this is how I work. I don't, I'm not very neat when I do this, so I just pull through this and, and pick out what I want to use for the rug, and that's how I'm doing this. I'm using this total, totally with, scrap, with scraps, and I don't know if any of you guys showed up with scraps like this, but basically you would just go through and, and sort out this and figure out which was light and dark and go. 
And that's what I did on this. And I'm using a really dark one to outline it. Thank you. Cool. And a question if you do your motif first and then the grid lines. Ah. Uh, okay. So um, I think you, looks and, like and this particular one, I'm going to say I do the grid line first. I'm going to call this is a, a I hate this actually because it's on the diagonal. I'm doing that too to make myself do it. So I put in these, these are in essence the grid lines. So I put in this line this line, this line, and then I go through and I do in, in the lines because you always want to hook up to something. So these are basically your holding lines. Having said that, if I am doing something like this, it's easier to hook what's on top first. So I hook this motif first. So I get the whole flower in and then I do the grid lines and then I do the squares. If I didn't do this motif first, I wouldn't be able to get the crisp lines of the sunflower. This way I hook this first and then I hook this up to the sunflower. And so I, I get a clean line for the flower. So the answer to that question is to do what's on top first, I think, and then do the grid lines and then do the color, unless you don't want to. I'm, I'm still not into rules, but, but that, that's probably the easiest way to do it. You might go out of, uh, you might, a lot of that order just because you're trying to play around with something. Since we're talking about grid lines, I'm going to bring in another rug that I wasn't talking about as far as just value, but since we're talking about grid lines, and this is an ex this is an excellent presentation, by the way, as far as showing you the grid lines, because the grid lines is, are just another way to use values. And so, as I said, the contrast is what makes the design work and with this grid line here, I have the highest contrast that you can have. It's the black and white. And so I have the black and white here. That's the highest contrast that you can make. And then I have all these. So your eyes are going to go right to these. And then the colors are in there. And the black and white makes it really pop. And then with this, the order, I would have done the sunflowers first. And then over here, I have different grid lines, because why do one when you can do more? So I use some kind of a dip dye in here, and then I just have black and white here, and then I flipped that idea over here, and I have black and white beading, if you know what beading is. You don't need to know for the concept. So, so this is beaded, and then I have the colors in here, so I sort of flipped the background. So this is black and white squares with colored grid lines. This is colored squares with black and white grid lines. So it all depends on what the look you're going for and how to capture that look. And if you have concept of value, chroma, and intensity, I mean value, contrast, and intensity, you will be able to do whatever it is you want to accomplish. And two questions. If you, yeah. I guess this is a fall, if you had any fall pumpkin rugs, and if your bin is all different widths of this is totally off topic. This is a fall. <laughs> this is a fall pumpkin rug. Hold that, Amy. Since we're just going with this, I'll show you my. They're not for everybody, but this is Franken wine. So uh, there are two. <laughs> are you laughing, guys? Those are two Halloween rugs I have. And what was the other question? Um, like your bin of scraps, if it's all different widths. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. You can do that. You can, you can be as precise. I'm going to do it. I'm dumping it. <laughs> you can be as precise or as precise as you want to. It depends on what you're doing. If, if you're trying to learn something different, if you're trying to, if you're trying to do something specifically for someone, you might be more rigid than you would for yourself, but you can use, for sure, you can use different cuts and rugs. Absolutely. And when I did a lot of these rugs, it just doesn't matter if you use different cuts. So this is what I have. Amy, get over here. Let's, <laughs> thanks guys. <laughs> so you can just separate this out. This is actually, so here's a really nice blue. So we can put that, we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make light and dark piles. Okay, so obviously, where's that go? Right there. Now, I'm 
I, it, there's a brighter color in there, so we'll deal with that. But let's just see how we do with this. I just want to do a little bit of this, because this is what I was going to do, and I thought would be interesting. And Amy's a beginner. She definitely has, you have a bit of an art background, though. A little bit, yeah. I took so, that class in senior year. Yeah, so she's got a little bit of a background. But basically, it's this is pretty easy to think about. What you're doing is, okay, I'm going to separate these rugs into light and dark. I'm actually going to let Amy do it. So she's separating the rugs into light and dark. She's not going to think about bright now. We're going to think about that later. And there's going to be some iffies. Usually there's some iffies, although if you notice, Amy is not stopping, so she's not finding anything iffy. She's just going for it. Sometimes you'll have something that can go into either pile, and when you do that, it's okay because you can use it on either side. So when I did this rug, I'll just put that here, you can still watch Amy. Some of these wools, like this green here, I believe is the same green here. And I think it's pretty obvious that this is the lighter square and this is the medium square because this is going to be your dark. Your grid lines here are your dark. Some of them are crossovers, so you can have them in both piles. So if it's like you could have a light and a light medium, well, a light and a light dark, a dark light and a dark. So that's, they can go into either pile. So here's some reds. I'm trying to avoid that. Can you see it? So <laughs> she was avoiding the reds. I'm putting the reds in. In the dark? Yeah. So this is... This is all you have to do to make a rug like this. It's actually kind of therapeutic. It is therapeutic. <laughs> and it also uses up your, your scraps. So if she decides that in her light pile she has, she doesn't want that much pop because some of those colors are bright, she could, if she was doing a log cabin, the yellows, which is the brightest, could be a center or a brighter part of her rug. It could also be, the main, if you were doing another kind of a rug, it could be your main motif. It could be your flower. So you could have, those wool could be what you use for your main motif, and then these could be like, the dark could be the background and the light could be something else. So you can pull out and adjust, but mostly you can use everything. I don't think I eliminated anything because I've got, I've got yellows in here. I didn't eliminate any of these. If I took this yellow, I could put this yellow in here. If I put it over here, I might think that jumps too much, so I might take it out and maybe go to this yellow and put that yellow in there, or not. Maybe. So it's all about eye-catching with everything it's around it. it. Yeah, there, there. This, this will go either way. This will go anyway. I have some of this in here too. So that's all you have to do to separate these, these rugs and then you can work right into it. You can put these into a bag. You can do it just as is. Don't have to think about it. What you're gonna do, just plop them in. If you wanna adjust them a little bit, you can. If you wanna eliminate, <clears throat> well you can. Now she's got white in her pile and like when I did my medium and dark rug, you might not want that white in there. So you can just eliminate that white and just carry on pulling out stuff. Pulling out what you think is too bright, pulling out what you think is too dark. If you had grid lines, maybe that dark would be your grid lines, but the bright could be your grid lines. And I, ha I think that when you do did grid lines that are um, light, like white or a real light color, it looks really contemporary. I really like that look. Questions? Um, it, anybody nope. did this? <laughs> anybody make this mess? So that's really it. That's, it's not really an easy concept to grasp, but it is once you get it, you have it. And you can use it with every rug that you do. Every rug doesn't have to be a struggle to figure out the color plan, <clears throat> or because it's a value plan. So if you use values properly and know how to use them, you can make a great rug. Are you showing anything back there? Oh, yes. Let me just show you, <laughs> talking about contrast. Did they ask to see this? Or you no, I, I remember so, you mentioned it. <laughs> on this rug, I told them to come back here. On this rug, the black and white heart, there's the highest contrast in the rug. 
So your eye goes right there. And I did that on purpose because that's where I want you to go. This is, I was in a, a challenge for doing card rugs and this is my card. And I wanted you to focus on the heart first. And black and white used to be a rule. I don't know if people still do that to never use black and white in a rug. I never got that because it's so effective. And you think about Mary Engelbright doing her black and white borders, which I did on this rug. This is a black and white border. And so the black and white border grabs you on the outside of it. And then after you see that, once your eye settles into that, you come up and then you see the center of the rug. So black and white can be a very effective uh, concept. And also, I beat it with black and white here. I do a lot of bleeding, <laughs> beating, and I do it in black and white a lot because it just accentuates everything. This, by the way, is sculpted, if you're looking at that tulip. And I've used this a lot on my ad on the back cover of the Atha magazine, which we're going to hold up for you when we're done. <laughs> Any more questions? Not yet. Not yet? Well, I think that that is can be it. Here's Amy. What you got? Yeah, I was playing. Amy's still playing. She's still separating all of that wool. All that wool can be used. I love salvages. If you like, if you like, and you have a lot of salvages, you can cut those and use those. There's no reason why you can't. I pull my all of mine off because when I sell wool, I take the salvages off. But you can do all kinds of cool things with salvages. And so I think that's about it. I'll do a little up close of this. Oh yeah. Oh, I know what I wanted to also mention. So, what everybody wanted me to do is a finishing class. And I think it's the only thing any, anybody actually asked for. And finishing is not my forte because I really don't sew. And my husband always did all of my finishing for me. And I will find, I, I can show you some finishing. I'm not gonna do it today, but I am going to find someone who is a good seamstress and who has written a book on finishing and ask her to do a program for you. But one of our advertisers is called Finally Finished, and she will finish your rug for you, and that's not cheating. I have not done it, but I would do it. It's called Finally Finished. Her name is Anne French. Here's the information, but you don't have to worry about that because our um, website person is going to put this on YouTube, and she's gonna have, she'll have a link for that. But this is one of our advertisers. There's Amy helping. <laughs> So let's see. So I, there's my email address. You can always contact me. That says AOL. It's hard to read. Uh, value, it, uh, color enhances design. Value establishes and solidifies the design. We've been talking about that. So the, the definition of value is light and dark. The definition of contrast is black to white, and it's all relative. Everything that stands next to each other is relative. Black and white is the highest contrast you can have. And the definition of intensity is dull and bright. Contrast makes the design visible, remember? So when you have when you have the white sheep against the bright or dark background, the sheep is gonna stand out because the light comes forward. Questions? No. <clears throat> okay. So this is our at the book. This is this is, we are the Association of Traditional Hooking Artists. This is our magazine. It is chock full of pictures, chock full of articles, how-to articles. It is only $32 a year for U.S., 36 I think, for Canadian. All the information will be on the YouTube site. Uh, it's just, it's, look at all the pictures. It's amazing. Cheryl Ballenbach is our editor. She has themes. This clearly looks like an animal theme book. Yeah. yeah, with lots of animals. So this just one after other. These are all our members. You have to be a member to be in here. But but then you can have your rug published and you can write about it. And it's really cool. And if you don't think you can do that, there are people who will help you. These are all the advertisers so that you're looking for to get supplies. And you always want to support your rug hookers. And you want to, you don't want to go to Joann's and just get materials because they don't sell the right stuff. You want to go to a rug hooking supplier. So they're all in here. There's chickens and more. 
There are um, chapters. We have chapters and you can go to them. Here's, here's chapter meetings. So if you live, like I just heard from somebody who lived in Tennessee and she didn't know where any groups are, well, it's by state and it'll tell you exactly what's happening in your state and when and where. It's really a great magazine. We just finished a biennial. We, have, we go to our members. So rather than a brick and mortar place, I think a lot of people wish we'd do that because it would be easier to get to and it wouldn't be reinventing the wheel every time. Um, I'm, I just saw our village, which I think is a wonderful place. And it's great unless you live in Texas and you can never get to Ohio for some reason. We come to our members. So we've had biennials in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Cleveland, Ohio, San Antonio, Texas. And we just had our last one in Kansas City, Kansas. It was last week. It was fantastic. So again, there was all kinds of classes that you could take, um, speakers, a huge exhibit. And so that's you get to do that as a member. Uh, and we have insurance, so if you have a group and you need insurance for a place that you meet, we have insurance for you. We have an incredible library that's put on by Deborah Burson, our librarian. She can send you, I don't know how many books we have, but it's a lot, and it's very well organized. All that information is in the magazine, and I'm not sure how much information will be on the YouTube, but I know at least the information on finishing rugs will be on there. Oh, and look at this ad. Oh, look. look shameless, <laughs> shameless advertising. That's my ad. <laughs> so if you need anything from me, you know what, Mark? Show them that rug. To your right is the rug that's, that's on my, that, um, yeah, my, my other right. My other right. <laughs> that's one of my favorite rugs, actually. And that's the rug that's on the cover right now, the back cover of my ad. Anything else? No. Okay. Well, I could go on, but I think I think we can call it a day. You can. I would love to hear what you would like me to cover. I will cover finishing. I know that's what everybody's interested in, or a lot of you are. And I will cover finishing, but I don't think I'm going to start it now because it's like a whole other, it's a whole other concept. So, thanks for coming. And right. contact me anytime you want. You have a question? Everyone loves your shirts. <laughs> oh, thank, you. thank you. Not that we, not that we coordinate. No, never. Uh, we don't have a meeting for it. Yeah, if you'd like us to wear something next time, just let oh, us know. Oh, yeah. You never I mean, next time it's Halloween, so it'll oh, be good. Oh, Halloween? Oh. Never mind. You've got to come. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much.